Today we're going to be talking about meaning and how you represent words on a computer. In the previous lecture we saw how useful it was to have a hidden layer in neural models. And can we do something similar for words? If we had a representation for language that allowed us to represent words based on their meaning, we could be able to, for instance, answer questions like how similar is pizza to pasta? And today we're going to talk about ways that we can answer these questions. These questions will be quite useful for things that we'll be doing later and applications like question answering. And to justify this a little bit more, we'll start off by comparing why you might want to do this in contrast to things like one hot representations like what we've been doing or using fragile knowledge bases. Broadly, this kind of method is called distributional semantics. That is, you learn something about the meaning of the word based on the other words that it appears with. This is called the distributional hypothesis from Harris. And one way of summarizing this is a famous quote, you know the word by the company it keeps. That is, you know what a word means based on the words that appear next to it. Before we get into it, let's talk about the alternatives that you might do instead. What if you process words just like humans do. We process words by looking at a screen or a piece of paper and some photons hit our retina and we create an image. This is how we do it. Why can't a computer do it the same way? There are other arguments why you might want to do this. For instance, if a document is written in Comic Sans or Gothic font, the font tells you something about what the document is saying as well. So you're losing information by turning everything into strings. But the downside is that you basically turned optical character recognition into a pre-processing step, and that's a whole research area unto itself. So why don't we use strings instead? So strings are also a natural choice but it's kind of wasteful in terms of memory. You have to store each character as one or two or even four bytes, depending on your character set. And then you're faced with questions like, is lowercase d, uppercase o, lowercase g different from uppercase d, lowercase o, lowercase g? Maybe not. And what about dog with a leading space and dog without a leading space. Are those different words or not? So if you use raw strings, you have to answer these questions. So these are questions that we've been avoiding thus far in this class. We've been taking some sort of pre-processing where we can do things like remove verb forms and plurals and collapse dogs and dog into a single integer, and then using that as our representation for things like logistic regression. And this is a good place to start. That's why we started it in this class. But maybe we can do something more. There are good reasons you might want to do this, but maybe we might want to do something more. This is very memory efficient, but it removes connections between words. And so you might have dog becoming word 24601, and you might have poodle becoming word 1701. What's the connection between those two numbers? In an integer representation, you lose out on that. In this class, we'll take a jump from integer representations to vector representations, but historically that's not what happened. There were a lot of things in between. And even though we won't spend too much time on it in this class, just to give you a historical perspective, let me mention some of the things that came in between while we were figuring this stuff out. So what about a dictionary? You could use that to represent a word's meaning. That's what humans do. And there are electronic dictionaries like WordNet. WordNet represents the meaning of a word as a path through a directed acyclic graph. So for example, here you have the word colt, which can either mean a young horse or a kind of weapon. Those two meanings are represented as different paths in this directed acyclic graph. So you can use the path through this tree as a way of representing a word's meaning, and words like full and colt will have similar paths, and thus they'll have similar meanings. You can also build trees like this automatically. Brown clusters are a way of doing this. And here you basically build a binary string based on how similar the words are, i.e. how similar their contexts are, and build a tree like that, and then you can represent word similarity based on bit signatures of the words. 
Another option, if you have written dictionaries and not electronic dictionaries, is that you can look at the definitions of words. So for example, uh, we asked this question, how similar is pizza to pasta? You can look at the dictionary definitions of these two words and you can see how similar they are. And so for example, you see that both of them are an Italian dish and so that's encoded in the words that are used to describe what pizza and pasta mean. So you could use that to represent these words you can infinitely regress on this. Uh, origin and originally are somewhat similar. You could use word similarity on that to get that uh, pasta and pizza are even more related. So these are the methods that came before. Now we're going to focus on distributional semantics that you can get into vector representations. So let's see an example from Baroni. Marco saw a furry little wampamuck hiding in the tree and wampamuck is a made-up word, but what do you think wampamuck actually means? Uh, you might think, well, maybe this is like a squirrel or a chipmunk, and why do you think that? It's a furry little thing that lives in a tree, and other furry little things that live in trees include chipmunks and squirrels uh, and things like that. So you, you're able to infer something about wampamuck even if you've never seen it before, which you probably haven't. And the way that we're going to let a computer make the same sort of inference that you just did when you saw wampamuck is we're going to encode words with similar context to be close in some vector space. So here we have musical instruments and food-related stuff clustered together, and we're going to have vectors represent the kinds of contexts that words live in so that we can do things like a cosine similarity or a dot product to see how similar two different words or concepts are. Now that I've laid out the big picture, let's take a step back and discuss some vocabulary. So there are two confusing terms that often get discussed when you're talking about vector representations of words that encode meaning. You have distributional word representations and distributed representations. And so they're related, but they're not the same thing. Distributional representation is the more general concept of representing a word in a way that reflects the context in which it appears. And so this doesn't have to be a vector representation. There are other ways that you could do this. If you go a step further and use a distributed representation, that's using something like a vector to create a compact, low representational representation of a word's meaning. And not all distributed representations are distributional, but most of the time they are, and these words are used a lot together because the biggest use of distributed representations is for distributional semantics. These representations are very useful, and I don't think it's going too far to say that they've revolutionized natural language processing. And why have they been so important and so successful? One reason is that they're multimodal. You can use these same distributed representations to represent images as words and documents and objects within an image. And so all of these entities can live in the same space and you can ask questions like, how appropriate is this caption for this image? You can also use these representations to connect concepts across languages. So you can have the same vector representations make sense for German words as for English words, and you can do things like take the dot product between Hund, the German word for dog, and dog, the English word for dog, or Go, the Chinese word for dog, and you can compare how similar are they across all of these languages. And there are many downstream tasks that you can use these representations for. One thing that I'm particularly interested in is for navigating large document collections or answering questions. We'll see examples of this later, where we can represent both words and documents, questions and answers with a single vector representation, and use that to answer questions or to navigate a large document collection.